I've been rolling the dice all my life. Everything's a dice roll. Every jump, everything. Just roll the dice, you know? In the beginning, for sure. But as I learned jumping and figured things out and, and learned from mistakes, then it got a little bit more dialed in. It was less guesswork. But so much of my life and chasing that dream was a roll of dice. I don't know if it's going to work or not. Let's see what happens. Give it a shot. Do you do you think a lot about that stuff now? Like, when you know, you flying over here now, you're doing, like, the Krusty Tour still. It's like there's still so much cool shit that you're involved in but it's like do you think about like it, it's so it's you want to say luck but like it's never really luck but in your day the odds of making it was so much less like do you think about how all this shit played out like even meeting Bubba that first day in race deck like what if you guys didn't meet or do you think that what you were doing and the way that you were going was like with the the way you were riding the hits that you were sending and stuff like do you just think it was inevitable like someone was going to find me in California not inevitable but things fell into place and I met the right people at the right time and uh, it just wouldn't happen if I didn't make that first step and move out there with $1,400 to my name and didn't know a soul and just to meet Bubba right off the bat and those guys it just it was meant to be you know certain things in life are just meant to be but if you don't sack up and give it a shot, it might be risky. Everybody might say, oh, you're not going to pull it off. You'll be back with your tail between your legs when that money's gone. You, you can't just move to California yeah. and pull it off. You're right out of high school. You don't really have any trades. You don't know anybody that owns any company that's going to put you to work. What are you going to do? Where are you going to work? What are you going to do Like after the first month when the money's gone? You'll be back. If 1400 is fuck all yeah <laughs> and it just all fell into place i met dana he said well what do you what's your job what do you do i said i'll do anything he said well, let's do some metal stud framing and drywall i said all right put me to work so he took me to work every day we'd bring our bikes to work after we got on working we'd go ride and get footage filming riding with the uh, top pros of the day like top racers mcgrath emic all those guys you know and they were just in magazines to me and now to be riding with them and okay well they just hit that jump i guess i have to hit that jump if I want to be in the video, I can't not hit the jump. Yeah. yeah I got a piece of shit bike and no skill free riding, but I'm going to give it a shot. So <laughs> that's what the way it was in the early days. Was it hard to keep up with those boys at the start? Or did you find that you were able to like go sort of toe for toe when it come to like the free riding stuff? I, I'd hit all the jumps they hit, but in the beginning it was a disaster most of the time. Cause I had blown suspension and just didn't have the, the, the equipment really and mm. or the skill or experience but after a while and you know once i got a new bike and and re- did it more and more often and yeah i figured it out and learned but yeah it just took diving in and going for it so when you guys were doing the first crusty film was like everyone had jobs basically and it would it was literally like an after school project yeah everybody but the racers the racers are obviously yeah. getting paid to race and so we'd have to kind of work around their schedule when they had time to go free riding with us when they didn't have to be at the track practicing or fly, flying to a race or whatever their deal their schedule was we just work around that and if me and dana had a job out towards menifee temecula area where they all lived we'd bring our bikes to work we try to work six in the morning until two. Still have a few hours of daylight before it got dark, and hit Ritchie Canyon or Beaumont or wherever. Yeah. And then the big weekends, we'd go out to the sand dunes, and uh, just film all weekend. Was there much of like a pushback from the, like the industry when it came to like taking these races and being like, oh fucking, I reckon you could do that. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. A lot of their sponsors didn't like that at all. A lot of them told them you, they can't film videos if they're sponsored by them. They're being sponsored to race, not go cr- to hit crazy jumps for videos. And uh, there's a lot of bad mouthing the Krusty video as well when it first came out. A lot of the magazines. Oh, really? Oh, this is making our sport look bad. These people are drinking, partying, and burning things and making it all look like white trash, chaos, and it's not good for our sport. So people didn't want to be involved. Yeah, there was like a pretty clear line that got like started getting divided between you guys and then like the the sort of clean cut moto guys and then i think when the whole metal militia shit started that even went like a took it even a little bit further i think because i think i think deegan from my outside perspective it looked like he was actively hamming it up because he was like you know what this shit's selling let's fucking sell 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 like i think it's to me again from the outside it looked like this was just the way you guys were and then those guys took it even further by going like, well, if that's working, let's sex it up a bit and, and go even further with it. 
Yeah, and he saw a business opportunity to make money on it. You know, there wasn't any core companies like that with selling t-shirts and hats. It was just, and that was kind of like a, more like a club almost of groups. It was a group of guys that rode together. We all rode together. We wore the Meta Militia shirts and stuff, and it just launched the, it was so new and fresh. It was easy mm. to launch it with the videos, so it blew up. But yeah, they were always the dark horse, you know, um, crew. And Don't hang out with them. It'd be Deegan yeah. against Pastrana. Pastrana's a nice, innocent little yeah. little lad that doesn't swear. And here's Deegan over here with spikes on his vest and looking like Gwar, you know. But uh, it, they just it just played it up and, and created the good and bad just yeah. for TV. When we started doing X Games and motocross got allowed into X Games um, as one of the sports, that was huge for the sport. You know, it actually made it a sport. FMX freestyle motocross is a sport now. It's in the X Games. It made it to the action sport Olympics. Yeah. Well, did you like, so you said at the start that you thought like I knew this whole video thing was going to be huge, but did you ever think it would actually get refined into a sport? Never even thought about it. It's no. crazy. Eh? Yeah, it's crazy. But uh, what happened was Kerry Hart and a few people started hanging out with the, some of the BMXers like uh, Dave Miro or TJ, TJ Lavin, Lavin yeah. Kerry did, and saying, you know what, these, these guys are doing backflips and seat grabs and all these tricks on their bicycles. Why can't we do it on a dirt bike? We have suspension. We have more time in the air to do it and get back on the bike. If they can do it, we can do it. So that's that's where the big trick angle of it came into play was from the BMXers. And so that was like – when that all started going, did you make like an active decision not to like pursue that side of things and like just keep going down like the bigger, bigger, bigger? Or like what was the thought process there? I just felt like I kind of stood alone from the beginning of the motorcycle uh, video movement and I just wanted to stay that way. I didn't want to just be one of the mm. competitors being judged and have to see what medal I got to have fans because I was the first guy to get make a living on a motorcycle that didn't race.